Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. Happy Hump Day. And welcome to a special homeschool edition of the News Agenda with me, Fleet Street Fox. And today I'm joined by some special guests. We've got Zane Powells, a head teacher who's been delivering meals and laptops to his pupils during lockdown. Morning, Zane. Morning. Uh, we've got some ex teachers and educational experts and trainers, Rebecca Daniel and Sarah Brammel. And now we're going to discuss the ups and downs of homeschooling. We're going to share some advice and hopefully help you all make the best of this hellish situation we find ourselves in. And remember, this is the People's News Agenda. So get into the comments. Tell us how you're handling homeschooling. Give us your tips. Ask the experts some questions. You've got them here. So these have got so much expertise between them. Ask whatever's on your mind and we'll try to help you out as much as we can. So first off, the big question when should schools go back? Rebecca, um, what about you? What do you think? Are you homeschooling at the moment? Are you yeah. desperate to get rid of them? So Sarah and I were laughing the other day because um, Sarah's got three children and I've got one three and a half year old that's going on 13. Um, and we were thinking, when should schools go back? And I don't actually think there is an answer for that. And the reason why I say that is because unless we um, look at the numbers, um, and make sure that we are safeguarding not only our children, but also the community as well. I think that will be the moment where we know when schools should go back. Um, I don't know if that sounds really controversial because I'm a teacher so or an ex-teacher, and so I really do believe in the power of education, but I think that our safety and the young people's safety is, is paramount right now. Yeah, so when it feels right, is that, I suppose, is your answer then. What about you, Sarah? Three children? Right. <laughs> Three children. And that, you know, and I understand speaking to parents and speaking to teachers, everybody's absolutely desperate for schools to go back. But I have a slightly different perspective because my husband's an ICU consultant. And I know from him that the staff in intensive cares are absolutely broken. And news coverage seems to have moved away from that. So for me, the priority is still to protect the NHS you know, even though this situation is super, super hard on all of us, we have to make sure that the NHS is, is ready before we start to ease the lockdown, in my opinion. Yeah. Right. And what about you, Zane? How do you feel about the homeschooling? Uh, you got you up in Grimsby, where you are. You see some of the people who are struggling most with it. Yeah. So I walk around, live the meals every day. So I see the struggle from the parents' point of view and uh yeah, they're finding this tough. I mean, my opinion is I think schools should go back, you know, as soon as possible, after half term if possible. You know, schools on the whole are really, really safe places to be, as in the systems in place. However, you know, to carry out that, we've got to make sure we follow the guidance from the people that know more than I do, the uh, uh, the, the government and the, the, the advisors, the medical advisors, and see what they say. I mean, when they do events go back, it'd be good to go back with regards to where the numbers are in relation to your area. For example, around here, I think we're getting on to 90, 90 cases per 100,000, so really low. We're one of the lowest in the country. However, there are other places that are really high, so it would really depend on your numbers, in my opinion. You know, like I said, we're really low, so hopefully we'll get them back sooner. But who knows? Yeah. I mean... How long's a piece of string is the answer to the question, isn't it? Yeah, it is. yeah, I'm really worried about the children, the parents at home who the homeschooling started off really good to start off with. Now it's gradually to fall away slightly and uh you know, because they're struggling. It's hard work. It's hard yeah. work. As Amber says there, the schools need to open. My child's not coping with this at all. It's not fair. That novelty's yeah. definitely worn off for a lot of people, hasn't it? Um mm. now, Zane, I first of all I want to ask you, because you've been out giving laptops and school meals to children in your area um, all, the, all year in Grimsby and what is has anything changed from the first lockdown when we had that oh crikey this is exciting dangerous unusual novelty mm. thing <laughs> hello Rebecca's kid walked in the room um, and has anything changed to how you've got now what's the situation now compared to the first lockdown yeah, massively changed. The first lockdown, it was like I say, it was a bit of a novelty. The first couple of weeks, the kids were loving it. Uh, no school, it was fantastic. But gradually, as the it went on, and I delivered seventy, so it was seventeen weeks before the, uh, I delivered seventy weeks. The mental health of the kids at home gradually got worse. Now this lockdown, what's not happening? Obviously, the weather is a lot worse, so children can't go outside, and the garden even they just stuck at home. The, uh, the parent, there's more onus on the parents to get some home learning done. The children have got to do work. The schools have got to provide this work. And actually, the schools are, are 
not on the parents' back, but trying to encourage and help the parents to, to do more work. That's causing more friction at home, and obviously the children are struggling with mental health. Parents struggling with mental health. They're expected to do work and, and, and not a school environment. The boundaries are different, so there's, there's a lot of turmoil in a lot of the houses. That being said, there are some houses that are doing ace and loving it and uh, getting on really well. However, yeah. uh, there are a lot of families that aren't, and it's, it's a, it is a real worry. I'm going to the gates, and uh, parents come to the door and uh, crying, and they just can't do it anymore. They yeah. can't do it anymore, and it's, it's where I have to talk to the children and say to the parents, if, if, if you're getting like this, please close the laptop, do something nice. Mm -hmm. Get on the city, cuddle with your children, watch a film. It's not that important. You know, your mental health is way more important than doing a, a maths test or doing do something doing something ac academic. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've given them all the time. We're not trained educators. And we've also got this problem that we have, as some of our people have mentioned already. And do let us know how you're coping with homeschooling. Get in the comments and tell us how things are for you. Um, I mean, Samantha says there, I need my kids to get back to school. Their mental health is going through the roof and they need social life as well as school is the best place for them to, to learn, you know, to, how to work and everything else. But parents aren't educators. No. They often have to work at the same time. And children have a different relationship with their parents, don't they? I mean, Sarah, you're a teacher. You've got three mm. children. I bet most people at home who aren't teachers would go, well, you must find this easy then, right? Because you're, you're a teacher. You know how to teach them, right? But tell us. Yeah, do you know, that's so funny that you say that because that's what all my friends say to me. They're like, well, you're fine, so you're a teacher. And I'm like, no, you don't understand when it's your own children at home. It's a completely different ball game. They don't want to behave and cooperate in the way that they would for their teacher. But also we were laughing the other day because even though I've got an English degree, I taught English for 18 years, still can't do year two literacy. So, you know, I mean, it's, yeah, even if you're a teacher, I think, I, I guess, to be fair, it probably is easier that you have a bit of an understanding of how things work, maybe. But I think even for teachers, this is super hard as well. And of course, for teachers who are teaching online lessons as well at the same time. Um, yeah, it, it's not it's not an easy time for anybody. There's no doubt about it. No, of course. I just had Jaden there who said that his children have benefited from lockdown and the attention of their parents and so on. And then we've got someone like Olivia here who's dyslexic and is trying her hardest and logging on to these live sessions. But it's it's so behind. How can they possibly catch up? I mean, Rebecca, they've got there's just there's a load of parental guilt about this as well, isn't there? This pressure, especially after the first lockdown, everyone's at home. There wasn't much in the way of homeschooling. Teachers were, um, I don't want to say the rude word, uh, told off by the government, right, for, for not giving the children enough lessons at home. So now they're having to do loads of recording lessons and broadcasting lessons, as well as teaching those who are at school too. Teachers are working harder. They're on parents' backs a bit, as Zane said. And now parents have even more anxiety. So how can you, if you are a parent with all this going on, what would be your advice? How can they deal with it all? Yeah, and I would love to add to Sarah's point because we were actually laughing about this the other day. We're both qualified English teachers, literacy specialists, and we were like, we can't even do it ourselves. And, and that's a great <laughs> thing to share with everyone because no matter if you're qualified or not, experienced or not, this is a whole different ball game. It's completely different. Um, so what advice would I give? You've seen my three and a half year old that's just come bursting in and, and I've just got to the point where I've just started letting things go. And what I mean by that is her education is important to me, but I'm not an early year specialist. You know, the older children are more my cup of tea. Um, so what I do with her and what I'm what I'm encouraging other parents to do is kind of what Zayn has said, have fun with it. You know, we went out in the garden the other day and we made um, like bird seeds um, and we, you know, left them out for the birds and we were bird watching. We go for walks and we, you know, count how many steps we're doing. Just have fun with it. And also just realise that, again, this time will not last for forever. And it's probably the only time in our lives that we're ever going to have this much time, this much bonding time with our children. 
and okay, we all need a break sometimes. I definitely need a break. Um, we all need a break sometimes, but but try to just, you know, grab it with with all the hands and, and love that you can and, and just do what you can. Yeah, you can have a bit too much of them. That's one of the benefits of school is you get to you know, something else to look after. But it was, right. parents, parents can be emotionally manipulated by their children who know how to push all the buttons and where the sweets are hidden and stuff. And yeah. teachers have that distance and so they don't get pushed in the same way by the children they don't act up quite the same way now Zane tell me in your school in Grimsby how are teachers coping with this because they've had a lot of attacks haven't they from the government for saying you're not doing well enough or you don't want to open or you're stopping kids being educated and then there's parents having a go at them and saying you're not helping out enough one broadcast lesson a day is not good enough or whatever how are teachers dealing with all this because I I know as a university lecturer it's older children but it's actually more work to do things online than it is in person yeah, uh, our teachers are, are, are really struck that they came to teach you because they want to work with children face to face, supporting them immediately when they're struggling, you know, especially the SEN children who struggle more than others. You need that immediate support and that's not available now. You know, it's now online and the teachers are not coping. They came to a job to do this and now they're having to do a completely different job in front of a computer all day, just marking work. It's just... It, it, it's just not what they signed up for, and they are really struggling with that. The management, the exec head, had uh, a couple of meetings with all our teachers to uh, mental health me meetings, really, to make sure things are okay at home, because some of our parents are, like I said, their mental health is, is struggling as well. Marking just lo lots and lots of work. Some children are not getting on. They feel guilty because they're getting on to parents saying, "Why aren't you locking on?" And the children are playing off the parents, so that you know that they're under a lot of pressure, and uh, the mental health is really suffering because of the weird job we're asking them to do now. Uh, and, and they're missing the kids, they're missing the children, their face-to-face -face support. It's that relationship with the children that you get you get a lot from that, you know, for, in front of a screen here, it's, it's nothing, yeah. you know. It's, it's not it's, the same interaction. No, not at all. And like I said, the SEN kids, uh, yeah, they're finding life tough. They're finding yeah. life really tough. Now, we've been asking viewers during the week uh, on the Mirrors page to give us some tips and advice for homeschooling. Most of them have said gin, I've got to be honest. And I, I don't think that's wrong. But I've got one here from Mick Decay. I think it's his real name. This time around, Sam, my son was lucky enough to be able to go to school due to his extra needs and has done extremely well. The past week, I've had to self-isolate. There's no one to take him to school for two hours a day. I'm a single parent. So the school sent him work home. Which is a nice surprise. He's done every bit of it without problems, but it's really relaxed as long as the work's done by the end of the day that's all that matters to me yeah. there's also this kind of pressure isn't there on parents that you must be doing the job of a teacher if you don't do it your kids will fail partly because all the messaging we've had from the government that schools are so vital and it will cost as we saw a story last week it will cost children forty thousand pounds over their lifetime in lost earnings if they don't blah blah it'll affect them for the rest of their lives yeah. sarah is this it's obviously going to be a year of, that's just weird for everybody but is a year going to make a huge difference to a child's attainment obviously depending what year it is in their school career there will be gaps in learning there's no doubt about it and as Zane you know will say as well the it will really heighten the the gap the deprivation gap between those children who you know have access to the technology and, and those who don't having said that just really to reiterate what Zane's already said is that we, before the pandemic, we already had a huge impending crisis with teen mental health. And unfortunately, this pandemic is only going to exacerbate that. So as you know, Zane's already mentioned and Rebecca's mentioned as well, actually focusing on well-being and focusing on mental health is our priority as parents. We all want the best for our kids. We all want them to be learning. But mental health has to come first because schools can close the gaps in learning. That's teachers' jobs, you know, that's what we're used to doing. Whereas repairing damaged mental health is much, much more challenging for everybody. Exactly, but, you know, that's, yeah, that's a very interesting thing to be pointing out. Now, Lydia says, the government should help with all mental health more, uh, give free therapy free to all who need it. Yes, but, uh, you know, jam and unicorns as well. I, I don't think that's going to happen, Lydia. It should be doing. And as Sarah has pointed out, teachers aren't mental health experts. And parents aren't mental health experts. And parents, especially if you're working from home or you're furloughed or you're under pressure because of loss, of loss of earnings, you've got your own worries too. And obviously we take that out on our children sometimes, rightly or wrongly. That's what happens. It's normal. Um, 
Rebecca, when children do go back to school, whenever this is, what's the best thing anyone watching this could do to prepare for that? Because it's going to be, you know, we're institutionalised, we're in our houses, we're, yeah. got, I don't know, a siege mentality. So how can how can we prepare, hopefully only in a few weeks, for the next stage of going back? You're hopeful, Susie. You said in a few weeks, you're hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. We like optimism. Um, how do we prepare them? I think communication is key and having conversations with your children at home as parents and asking them, you know, what are their anxieties? What are their fears? What would they like to have happen when they go back to school? I think that's really important. Having that regular dialogue with your children and making sure that they are prepared mentally and as Sarah said that's the most important part is the mental ability to you know be able to wake up in the morning and feel the joy and they will feel the joy you know my daughter is so excited to go and see her friends at nursery and and she's always questioning you know why can't she see them and that social interaction that's what's going to get our children back where we kind of want them to be but we still need to have more conversations with them and I would say that schools also ease them in, you know, don't go chucking a test at them straight away. And, you know, come on, we need to catch up and do a baseline to see how far yeah. you've gone, you know, because I've got a feeling that that probably be on the agenda, right? Take yeah. time, allow them to enjoy the playground play that, you know, that they, they've missed and that they crave and get them to talk about lockdown. And I wouldn't say ignore it as if it hasn't happened. It has happened communicate that with them you know you could do a time capsule activity but don't go all guns in and, and and think that you know we need to kind of hit the ground running yet I think to talk to them have that communication with them is really important yeah and here's another tip from one of our viewers Sarah Hartles he says you know I hated it at first uh, but I was I tried to force my son into a routine and it was like battle of wills but I've now let him go at his own pace and the tensions of ease, but he's actually doing the work set, taking the initiative to do extra learning off his own back because he doesn't feel like it's something he's being forced to do. And that's always the best kind of teaching, isn't it, Zane? G giving yeah. them a taste of something until they enjoy it and then they go and sort of teach themselves in a way. You're As a teacher, you're not, you're not forcing things into their heads. You're yeah. opening their heads so they can go and put them in themselves. Yeah, yeah that's right, yeah. And... Although structure is good, and I, I, I think the school have got the structure, and it's hard to put that same structure in at home because it's home, it's completely different boundaries. So, I mean, maybe just saying to the children, well, we've got to do this, this, this today, three bits of work. Now we've got six hours to do it in. You know, I know what you want to play with your PlayStation or Xbox, or whatever device it is. So here it is. So if you do, and I did this with my own children, they're all left home now, they're all old. When they were revising for exams, I said, if you revise for half an hour, then you can get an hour on your Xbox. So whatever you do for your, uh, uh, any work you do, I'll double the time for something good for you. So, I mean, do something like that to children. So saying to the children, right, you've got 15 minutes maths to do. Once you've done the 15 minutes maths, whenever you do that, then I'm going to give you half an hour free time on you, whatever you want, and get put that in place already so the children know they've got some incentive to work to. And that happens the same at school. You know, if they don't do the work, then maybe they don't get a break. So, uh you know, there are those, there's still got to be tight rules, but there's got to be something in it for the children. You know, yeah. it's not just work, 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 because it, that won't work. No. It, it won't work, you know. Well, I've, I've got a five-year-old and she's great in terms of I can just, I can uh, bribe her with dried pasta. Right, I've got a jar and when she's done something good, a handful of dried pasta goes to the jar until it fills up and then she gets a, a, a present or something or something, a book or something at the end of it. And so she, she can see it and she puts the pasta in and she's, it's up to it. It's not going to work in a few years. The inflation will keep on. <laughs> um, Pink and Marsh here says, my wife is a Senko, a special educational needs teacher. Uh, I feel like I'm a decent dad. My 10-year-old gets all the support and she's still struggling. It's not right. I'm struggling to watch it all unfold. It's heartbreaking. I can't imagine how bad it must be for those disadvantaged. And, of course, Sarah, as well, if you if you are disadvantaged, you're more likely perhaps to have some special educational needs for your children. And those are the ones who are going to find it more difficult to learn online. Perhaps they don't have the right equipment and facilities at home that they would have at a special needs school. How can a parent of someone who's got a, a child that needs so much extra work, how can, how can they get through this year? What can they do? I know this is almost a stupid question, isn't it? Because they just, they can't. So what advice would you have to help them cope then? I think, in t well, in terms of coping, there's there's no doubt that 
that for many, many families, there are incredible challenges. You know, I think Dane probably knows better than I do, but you know, something like 20% of households don't have a table, you know, to work at. So there are huge barriers to many, many children in terms of learning. And at the end of the day, we have to have our basic needs met first, which means that if we're working, that the bread on the table is, is our number one as much as we want to support our children's education. In terms of children with special needs, the schools will communicate what those children need and support the parents who've got children who've got special needs. And so I would keep, you know, because I think sometimes parents can be a little bit reluctant to kind of bother the school or to ask questions, but they are the experts. They will be able to give parents guidance about what they can do. And then it's, you know, then it's probably, it's harder, but it's probably the same for all of us to just do the best that you can, you know, keep well-being first, just do the best that you can, just do little bits, as we've already mentioned, you know, when your children are engaged, when they want to, but actually we have to be kind to ourselves in this situation. As you say, Susie, it is, you know, really, really difficult situation. I don't think there are any easy answers. Here. I would say communication for school is key because they will need to know what the issues are, what the barriers are, so that when the children do go back, they can start to help address those issues. Yeah. If you ask a teacher for help, viewer, they always say yes because that's why they're a teacher, pretty much. As Lydia points out, how can our stressed parents help our kids with mental health? Because they've got the same issues. And I think it's the same thing as Zane said earlier on. It's just a case of knowing when to switch off and do something different perhaps you're going now one of the things that i was talking on twitter with someone about yesterday was that they were saying that the uk is not deprived compared to so many other parts of the world um that you know the, the mirror's got this save our schools campaign which has been kicked off by a one million pound donation from the national educational union to get pens and papers to poorer families and the suggestion is you know well look, if your kids have got nike trainers and you've got a smartphone then and you know or you can't feed your children then you know you buy some paper you're just being you're just being a distrustful um uh, unworthy parent in some way you shouldn't have had your kids if you can't look after them all the rest of it and saying when a story uh the other day in the mirror which you were quoted in you said people think poverty is all the way over there but if you look around the corner it's, it's literally it's just at the end of your street mm -hmm. so do you see when you're going around and delivering the laptops and the meals do you see the kind of deprivation that people assume just doesn't exist and that's affecting this problem yeah yeah, definitely. Yeah, people. We give billions to, to go to foreign aid, which is great, and 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 rightly so. But actually, poverty is around the corner. If you, if you look around the corner, it's there. And uh, we knew a lot of our families had challenging uh, home lives uh, before the, all this started. But me delivered, I've realised really how difficult they are. I mean, we have some amazing families, really proud parents who do their very best for their children. Uh, and the, 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 that irritates me when people say, "Oh, they shouldn't have, have children; they can't afford it." People get in the difficulties they're in because of circumstances, not because they've deliberately put themselves there. It's circumstances, and they do their best for their children. Whatever it is, they put their children first. And it just grates me when people say, you know, oh, they shouldn't have had children, or or they can afford this and instead of that. Actually, circumstances have got that in that place. And some of our families really struggle uh, with very limited funds, but still do their best for children. That's you know, I wish people stop thinking that they don't. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of distrust, I think, of the other side of whatever debate you're on. The other side, they must be somehow unworthy. As Christine says here, the school has asked my contracted hours as a key worker for the NHS for my child to attend school. Presumably the school is saying, Christine, that they only want the child at school for the hours that you're at work, as opposed to, you know, letting you judge for yourself when the child should go. Is this legal? Are councils aware of it? Um, I'm not sure that it's legal and I'm not sure that it's illegal, Christine. Um, no. It's one of those things where I think the school is probably trying to limit the number of children in school for a certain number of hours. At my daughter's school, she's going five days a week because I'm a self-employed single parent. But there are other children who are going one or two days. Here yeah. and there, because yeah. their parents feel that they can have them the rest of the time. Um, so I don't think they can. I think you could refuse. But I think also yeah. what you probably ought to do is discuss with the school and the teacher and say what your needs are. And just without having to give them all the details of when you're working or not, just say, well, look, you know, three days a week or two half days and three full days, whatever it might be, and try and take it from there. I mean, Rebecca, what would your advice be? 
Yeah, I was going to reiterate exactly what you said. I think that could be to do with ratios. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> purely to do with ratios, not to catch you out or anything like that. There, there has to be a certain number of um, teachers to student ratio. And with all the teachers that are, are off unwell or, you know, that have lost loved ones, you know, for various reasons that they're not in school, um, the school have to make sure that the kids are coming in and they're safe and that there's enough people to look after them. So I would say exactly what Susie had said. Great advice there. Communicate your needs. What do you need? And, you know, voice that to the school. And I'm sure that they will support you as best as they can. But don't feel disheartened if they say, you know, can you reduce your hours or, you know, it's all at the end of the day, it's all to keep you and your children safe and I think that's the most important thing yeah I agree exactly yeah. right and one last tip we've got here from someone uh, and do let us know in the comments how you're doing with homeschooling and Guppy says create a scenario of different names so I'm Sir something Sir Lancelot Sir Galahad I don't know uh, Sir Guppy and my daughter is someone else so obviously she calls herself a different name we do the register and we try to act as though you're not at home as much as you can and not be father and daughter now, Sarah, is this good advice or is this terrible advice? Can you leave the room and be dad again? Or is she going to see you as, you know, have you got to dress up in a mortarboard and stuff to be, to be a teacher? <laughs> Do you know what? I love this. I think yeah. anything that brings the fun, that changes the climate, that changes the resistance, do whatever you got to do. If you've got to dress up as Wonder Woman, do whatever you want to do. Just to change that dynamic, make it fun. I mean, why not? Yeah. I'm I'm often Beyonce in my household, I, and I don't. I, yeah, I, I'm okay with that. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Miss Beyonce. No, Miss Beyonce. Totally fine. <laughs> Lydia says single parents have it the hardest. I'm one, but my friend's got four children and yeah. no support. And this is something you were saying before we came on, saying we have to wind up in a minute. But the fact that the parents are at home and they may have children of several different years. They haven't got one year group all learning the same yep. thing. They've got perhaps three or four children doing multiple different stuff and you've got to go from algebra to writing numbers down for the first time and jiggle about it's really yeah difficult. yeah it's tough for the parents and like i said earlier on the parents themselves maybe aren't very academic and don't understand the stuff they're supposed to be teaching the children so it's really tough for them and uh yeah i mean i mean delivering the lunches around is easy compared to actually being at home with three four children having to teach them at different levels it must be really hard especially if you find uh, learning difficult yourself I mean, luckily, I, I go around and support those families, but uh, yeah, man, I really feel for the uh, the parents who are doing their damnest to support their children at home. Yeah, exactly. And we just had uh, a student up there saying she feels safer at home, and there's children who are benefiting from one to one at home, especially those who have got special educational needs. Now, let's yeah. try and end on a positive note because there must be something good that comes out of all of this. So, is there something? I mean, is there something positive? That we can take this. I mean, Rebecca, you were saying earlier on, this is a time where parents have got an unprecedented amount of time with their children yeah. and children with their parents, let's face it. And we yeah. teach our children every day, don't we? We walk around and just have a conversation with them. They're learning things, even if it is how to swear and poor mummy and gin and tonic. So what's what's the positive we can take out of this, Rebecca? It was it's funny, I had a coaching session yesterday and I didn't actually realise <laughs> that we were in a pandemic. Now listen to me, I'll, I'll tell you why. Because I actually made the decision late last year or early last year to just live life, just to take each day as it comes, reduce kind of my interaction with the news um, unless, you know, I wanted to kind of get an update. And what I have been doing is embracing every moment with my daughter that I haven't had. There are things that she has done that I've witnessed that I'm like, oh, I missed out on that. And I've been just enjoying that moment with her. And I guess the other positive is the positive of slowing down. We're, we live in a society where we're always constantly racing and doing, and we don't actually take the time just to slow down and to reflect. And that's what I've enjoyed the most. And I actually will go forward now knowing that that's definitely something that I need to include in my life more. Um, and I, I'm grateful for that. I think that's a wonderful note on which to end. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got to let Zen go about his business now. Thank you very <laughs> much, everyone, for joining me. Sarah, Rebecca, Zane. thank you, everyone, thank for you. watching for your tips. And there'll be some more tips, I'm sure, in the comments, so read through them. Uh, we'll be back with a news agenda next Monday, and we hope that we've given you some reasons perhaps to feel a bit more positive. And remember, close the laptop, go and watch a film, have a nice yeah. tonic, 
and that things will get better. We'll be through it eventually. Thank mm -hmm. you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Bye. <laughs>